It's great to see you here this morning as we celebrate Jesus and as we come to worship his name. And I know that it's by no mistake that you're here this morning. Uh, God has a word for you to hear, and God continues to bless us with his presence through the power of his Holy Spirit. Uh, back in 1958, a man named Pierre Colford, also known and better known as Peyo, invented some blue creatures. You know them as these little guys, Smurfs. And as a kid, I just loved these guys. I watched them on television and also collected, obviously, the figurines. This is one of the collection. And my kids still enjoy these today. And if truth be told, so do I. But as you look at the TV show and you follow these little guys around, you notice that they spent their time playing and singing and working, except for Lazy Smurf, that is. The rest of them did. And, and they all followed and, and did a wonderful job of just having fun and being productive. And along the way, they would always try to outwit Gargamel and his cat, Azrael. And this was a great adventure, and you could follow them. And who they followed was a man named Papa Smurf. He was the patriarch of the family, of the village, of all these little blue men and, and one lady, Smurfette. And they would follow Papa Smurf. And as they did, almost without fail, they would ask a question. And if you're a parent who has placed a child in a car seat and put him in the back of the car that you're driving, you know the very question that they ask. How much farther? How much farther? How much farther, Papa Smurf? Or how much farther, God? How much longer do I have to stay in this job? How much longer do I have to put up with this pain in my life? How much longer until we are pregnant? How much longer until this pain is over? How much longer until we finally have financial peace in our family? How much longer till I finish this degree? How much longer until I finally arrive? How much longer, how much farther until my child finally comes to his senses? I don't know what your how much farther question is, but you all have one. Some of you are waiting on that unexpected thing that you, you expect it, but you're not sure what it's going to look like. Some of you are waiting for relief. Some of you are waiting for news, good or bad. You just want to hear something. Some of you want healing. Some of you want physical healing. Some of you want emotional healing. Some of you just have that question, how much farther? Around 3,300 years ago, there was a Papa Smurf of sorts, although he was very much historical, not fictional. And this man was called by God to lead a nation, a what would be a nation, a people of slavery, had been four centuries of slavery, and God had promised them, as we've talked about before in previous weeks, God had promised him that all these years are not a waste, that God is going to do something, that God is going to rescue you, God is going to bring you relief. And they lost hope in this situation. And they weren't quite sure what to do. And so they had their own how much farther questions. Not only how much farther, literally, are we going to walk through this desert, but how much farther? Where's the water? Where's the food? Where's the variety of food? Moses, have you taken us out here to die in the desert? How much farther? And then, to their relief, the question is finally answered. They're standing at the entrance into this land. They're looking over into the land that looks very promising. Out of the desert, out of the wilderness. And now they look into this land that looks lush, that looks promising. But they're not quite sure what it's going to take. What it's going to take to go in. And so we have this question, how much farther? And God answers and he says, you are there now. Now it's your job to step up to the plate. It's your job to now go into the land. And I want you to hear the good news first. And this comes in the book of Deuteronomy. And we are reading the account that Moses is going to give of this experience. So this is not when this experience is taking place. It's Moses reflecting on what happened and telling the people, reminding the people of what happened. So Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, we're going to hear the account of what they do when they're finally at the entrance of what will be called the promised land, the land of promise. Then I, Moses says, 
Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Then all of you came to me and said, Let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected twelve of you, one man from each tribe, then left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, It is a good land that the Lord our God has given us. Sure enough, after four centuries, after so much time of slavery, at so much time of heartache, at so many times they've asked the question, How much farther? And God has answered it. And they say, they say Sure enough. Sure enough. Not only are we here, but the land is good. It is good land, and the Lord our God is giving us. The God is going to give us this. It's a gift. He is giving us. And that's the good news, but then the next word is but. And so we know it's not just good news, that there's more news to come. And so let's continue to read in verse 26. But you are unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made us lose heart. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large and with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. These great, impressive, dangerous people, if you will. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the desert. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. And so remember, folks, he's saying to them, God has come through over, over and over and over in front of your very own eyes. Yet, Scripture continues, in spite of this, you did not trust the Lord your God, who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. I want you to notice, and it's important you notice this, because as I said, we all have these how much farther events in our lives. When we lose hope, when we forget to trust God or simply fail to trust God, even if we remember we're supposed to, we lose our logic. We exaggerate. We blame. And look at the text, and you'll see how this happened to them. Keep in mind, their God, Yahweh, the one true God, has rescued them from slavery, has provided all this miraculous salvation through the plagues, has walked them across dry ground with walls of water on either side where a sea used to be, has protected them from all kinds of famine and all kinds of starvation and all kinds of thirst. He has provided for them. And one of the very first words they say in verse 27, the Lord hates us. Now, that's just not logical, is it? But how often have we done that? Maybe you haven't said those words, but you say, well, God, everything's been going great, but what, have you just left me here? God, have you forgotten about me? Life's so hard, do you even care about me anymore? Yeah, you did all that stuff in the past, but you're not doing anything now. Have you forgotten me? Where are you, God? And then if that doesn't work, we, we realize, well, I certainly can't be to blame, so let's blame someone else. And what do they do? They say, well, our brothers caused us to lose heart. Reminds me of when you see the very first sin enter into our planet. Adam and Eve are caught red-handed, if you will, and God addresses each of them, including the serpent. And when he gets to Adam, God says to him, what have you done, Adam? And Adam says this, that woman that you gave me caused me to do this. Notice what Adam does. He says, it's not my fault, it's that woman's fault. And by the way, God, you gave me that woman, so it's your fault. <laughs> Little guilt reflection, have you ever done this? No. Certainly it's not my fault. 
It's someone else's fault. Surely it's not my fault. It's my friend's fault. It's my spouse's fault. It's my child's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's God's fault. And so first of all, they say God hates me, and then they say everybody's, everybody else's problem. It's not mine. It's just something that we couldn't put up with because our brothers made us do this. And then they simply look at this phrase, devastating phrase. You did not trust, Moses says. You did not trust in the Lord your God. And again, I want to take you to that present moment for now or that moment in the past that you remember. And I don't take you back there so you'll have guilt or shame or remember something that's bad, but just so we can learn because we tend to learn from mistakes. Prepare us for our future. And, and so go back in that time or go into your present time and think of those times or time where you have failed to trust God. Did you lose the job because of it? Did you lose your marriage because of it? Did you lose that opportunity? Did you give in to bitterness? I don't know what you did. I know my story. I don't know your story. But in those moments of how much farther, what have you done when you've given up hope? And what have you lost when you do? But God is an everlasting, gracious God. And we understand that they complained and they grumbled and they blamed and they called upon God and said, you hate us. But he still loves them, but yet they did this one thing that was truly devastating to their experience, and that was this. They lost trust. And so the rest of the story goes like this. I encourage you to read it later. But God says to them, through Moses, because you have lost faith, because you did not trust me, not one of your mature men, not one of your adults, will enter into the land that I promise. Yes, I'll keep my promise. Yes, your people will go in, but you will not. The children, your children who do not, you know, the scripture says, who do not know yet the difference between good and bad, right and wrong, they will go in, but you will not go in. And that is a sad news to them because they've been asking how much farther, how much farther, and they're right at the threshold, and they're going to enter in if they would just trust God, and simply they don't, and God says, okay, turn around and go back to the land where you're going to constantly ask how much farther, how much farther, how much farther. And some of you are back there when you're doing this, how much farther, how much farther, how much farther. But the great news of the gospel as Jesus comes into that presence, into our presence, into that moment and says, I'm going to allow you a fresh start. I'm going to allow you to come into my presence again. And so we see this rescue as it comes about in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, we're going to read there in just a moment, but let me again set the stage for you. Moses is dead, and Joshua is going to be reminded of this, not because he doesn't know Moses is dead, but because he needs a reminder that he's in charge now, that he can't rely on Moses, he can't rely on his predecessor, he can't rely on the things that happened before. He is, in he is the one responsible. And so God is going to remind jo Joshua, it's your turn. You're going to lead these people. And so all this generation has died off. These 40 years have passed. And all of these adults that were not faithful because they lost trust in God, they have died. But God has provided for them for all those years. He gave them food. He gave them water. He protected their feet. He protected their flesh and their soul and their energy. And God says to them, this is your job. Train up your children so that they'll be ready. And sure enough, they are ready. And in chapter 1, of Joshua here the experience after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord the Lord said to Joshua son of Nun Moses is aid Moses my servant is dead now then you and all these people get ready and cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them to the Israelites I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west, that's the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with you, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor 
forsake you. And then in chapter 3, verse 17, we hear the culmination of this great event. It says, The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And so you see this reminder to Joshua and this reminder to the people that God is still with them, that he will never leave them nor forsake him. Because if you remember the story, and if not, let me tell you briefly, what happens is as the Hebrew people leave Egypt, there is a great barrier in front of them. That's called a big body of water, the reed or the Red Sea. And it is before them, and the Egyptians are behind them because Pharaoh came to his senses and said, why have I just let all my workforce go? And he chases after them, and they are panicked. And God says, do not fear. Moses, take that staff, which used to be your staff, now it's mine, and strike the water, and your people will go across on dry land. And they didn't go off on muddy land. They didn't go off on sort of, sort of dry ground. They went across dry ground with waters on either side, and they remembered this. And they told the next generation. So lo and behold, now it's time to go into the land. And guess what they do? They're at another body of water. And God says, Joshua, not a staff anymore. But the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the Ten Commandments, which holds these sacred things that point to the mighty power of God, that God has not forsaken them or left them. The priests walk into that water, and in an instant their feet touch that water, they separate, the ground is dry, and the people literally have to walk by this reminder, this Ark of the Covenant, as they go across into the land. And he promises them, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I want to remind you that Scripture is not here just so we know some history. Scripture is here so that you know this is a story of redemption. And God says to us, just as he said to Joshua, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The question is, will we believe that? Will we trust him? Just in case you don't get the connection, I want to draw your attention to the man who just led them across the Jordan River. Let me remind you of his name and what his name means. Joshua, his name means Yahweh is salvation. By the inspiration of the Lord, by the way, Moses changed his name to this. And his name means Yahweh is salvation, the creator of all, the great I am. He is your salvation. And this is the message they needed to hear, that God is salvation. Moses isn't your salvation. Joshua isn't your salvation. God is your salvation salvation about 1300 years later this baby born in a manger you know the story and God comes with very specific instructions in the form of an angel and he comes to Joseph the adoptive father if you will and he says to them says to Joshua Joseph rather these words Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Focus there, the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Anybody want to take a guess what the name Jesus means? Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh saves. So Joshua is the Old Testament foreshadowing of the fact that God is the one that rescues, that God is the one that leads. And so when Jesus is born, yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he's Christ. Hebrew and Greek translations of the anointed one. But he has another name, and his name is this, Jesus And why in the world would an angel come and say, Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus? It is a reminder to the Hebrew people, the Israelites, as it is a reminder to us that Yahweh is salvation, that God is salvation. So when he comes on the scene, Jesus, and he says, my name is Jesus, the Hebrews understood what was being said. Just as Joshua led the people of Israel from a land of questioning and grumbling and crying out anger towards God and blaming your neighbor and frustration and and pain and heartache out of this land, Joshua brought them into a new land of promise and of peace and of victory. And then Jesus comes and he takes us out of a land of devastation, a land of depression, a land of anger. We're calling out to God and blaming our neighbors and saying all these things that are dragging us down and those around us. And Jesus comes and says, follow me. 
follow me? And we're all asking the same question again, how much farther? And John tells us Jesus' answer. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way I read that verse is this, in this context. As Jesus comes into the scene and the Jews are saying, how much farther? Now we're living under oppression again as we did in Egypt. Now we're living under the Roman oppression. And the Gentiles are saying that if Jews hate us, how do we have any hope? (laughs) And Jesus comes to the Jews and Jesus comes to the Gentiles and he says, I've got this thing. I, name means Yahweh is salvation. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so he is the answer to everybody's question of how much farther. And again, I don't know what your question is. It's probably not a geographic question about how much farther till you get from one point to the next. But you are having questions. of How do I get out of this situation? And how do I make this decision? And how do I heal from this pain? And what am I to do if my body is a wreck? And I- how to get better and what am I to do with this marriage that's falling apart and what am I supposed to do when my child is sick and what am I supposed to do etc 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 and Jesus steps into all those questions not just one of them not just about eternal life but in now in life within time he steps into it and says I am the way I am the truth I am the life in other words he says stick with me I can handle this we hear about things all over this globe that cause heartache and pain, and you're no stranger to them. But I was recently reading a publication, this one right here, and uh, it's from a Christian organization uh, called The Voice of the Martyrs, and what these people do, this ministry does, is it follows Christians around the globe who uh, suffer much more for their faith than we. And they pray for these people, and they invest money and time energy into these people and one of the places where they're focusing right now is in a land torn apart by civil war Syria is the place and I want to share some words by Pete Todd and Nettleton about this he's reporting from Syria he says most Americans have seen the graphic images of bombed out Syrian cities and citizens killed by chemical weapons. But amid these stories of chaotic civil war and tragedy is another less publicized story. Christian churches in Syria continue to spread hope in the face of hopelessness. Holding high not a political or denominational banner, but the banner of Jesus Christ, the only path to salvation and peace with God. Before the outbreak of war, an evangelical church in one of Syria's largest cities held several services a week for worship and prayer. Today, it holds twice as many services, and most are standing room only. More than 70 Muslim families have turned to Christ in an area of Syria where only a dozen or so Christians existed 18 months ago. We are working with Christians in neighboring countries to provide material assistance and gospel materials to Syrian refugees in these countries. They are seeking hope and they have nothing, a VOM contact said. They've lost their house. They've lost their family members. They've lost some of their children. And they're holding on. They're holding on to the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. They've lost their home. They've lost their family. They've lost loved ones. They've lost so many things. Yet, they are holding on to the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. That story grabbed my heart as I was reading it weeks ago because what it tells me is that in the midst of some of the most chaotic situations we can imagine, that it's not going to be a political power, it's not going to be a denominational power, it's not going to be some act of mankind that is going to bring out hope and going to bring out security. We all can study the history of our globe and see how many times nations have stepped in and promised hope only to see that turned on its head the very next day or the next year or the next generation. 
And we've seen people go in with, with causes of goodwill, yet it all falls apart because all they have to offer is food and clothing and water, which are great things to offer, but they don't offer Christ along with it. And here in Syria, in the midst of chemical weapons, in the midst of bombs, in the midst of two sides that literally hate each other, there, are, there is a people known as Christ followers who are standing in the gap, if you will, and saying, I don't know what's going on around us, and we're not going to highlight that. We're going to highlight the way, the truth, and the life. And because of that, Christians are being encouraged, and people of other faiths are coming to Christ. And one of the things that happens here in our nation as well as around the globe is people so often miss the answer. Every one of us on the planet has asked and will ask or is asking the question, how much farther? And there are people just grabbing at this and that and that and trying to get some relief, some pain, some, or some release from pain and some joy. And they're just grabbing on anything they can and, and nothing lasts. It breaks, it fades, it spoils. But Jesus Christ is saying, I'm here, take me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. We have some neighbors we believe is our neighbors. We're not quite sure. We went on a thing with our neighborhood the other day, last night, in fact. Uh, three of us had some, three homes had a progressive dinner. And by the way, it's a great way to do it if you eat, walk, eat, walk, eat, walk. Um, but we got home between appetizer and dinner, and on our front porch there was a plate of cookies, which always makes you happy. And, uh, and next to the plate of cookies was a wrapped gift, and it didn't have a name on it. Had our name, but not a from name, and we didn't know what it was. Didn't know who it was from. And we opened it up, and next to the plate of cookies was the what is called the Another Testament of Jesus Christ, also known as the Book of Mormon. And I looked upon that, and I saw that they put some real thought into it. They tabbed some pages. They highlighted some pages. They even drew a Christmas tree with some presents on a sticky note. They said, please read. And the first thing that went through my mind, at least one of the first things, was this. That in the midst of this season where Jesus Christ has come, and this same Jesus Christ lived the sinless life, was crucified on the cross. And what did he say from that cross? He said, it is finished. In other words, there needs to be no other testament of Jesus Christ. There needs to be no addendum to the story. The story is this, that Jesus Christ came as a babe, was born in a manger, walked in complete communion and faithfulness with the Father, died on the cross for our sins, said it is finished, was buried in the grave, rose again, and said, I am the way and the truth of life forever and ever and ever with this scripture. He keeps saying this. And so I don't know what the straw you're grabbing at or what thing that might be that temporary relief. Maybe it's a false religion. Maybe it's a candy bar. Maybe it's an unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's uh, money. I don't know what it is that you're grabbing onto. But none of it, none of it is going to bring that hope. There's a proverb, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, that says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I love the imagery there because we know what it is to have a sick heart. When we don't grab that hope and we defer it and defer it and defer it. But then through God, when that is that's fulfilled, that longing is. The tree of life. The tree of life. Come to me and I will give you life. I came across a poem a while back, it's of old, and just a little piece of it. it talks about some desperation. I want you to look at this. It talks about the voice, and the voice is a person crying out to God, not the TV show, by the way. It says, the voice that yet is silent. In other words, God's ignoring me. God, you hate me. God, you don't care about me. The voice that yet is silent, the one voice that could bring me triumphant, rapturous, clear, Oh God, oh God, the message my soul is sick to hear. God, do you care? God, have you heard me? Would you just say a word? Would you give me some kind of glimpse of hope? 
can't hear you. I'm sick at heart. I can't hear you. What's your message? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. That tells us that God is not silent. That God is here. For I bring you good news of great joy. for all people, all people. I ask you to take your question, your how much farther question that you're asking this morning, and to use an old phrase that sounds religious, but it's beautiful, lay it at the foot of the cross. Just look upon that cross that's in front of you behind me and recognize what that stands for. See, Christmas is really about what's to come. The great sacrifice, not just about a baby. And so whatever question you have and you're longing for an answer, you're longing for some hope, you take that question to the cross and say, Jesus, would you please answer this for me? And he will. And he actually already has. Because he sent the son, his son, to bring you life. And so would you please take out your C2 card with me? And this is a card where you could say to God, I need some prayer. And church, won't you help me with that? Won't you help me pray for God's wisdom and God's direction? You see, I've been deferring my hope way too long. I've been kicking it down, but I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Or there's been a weight on you for quite a while now, and you realize today that that weight is God saying to you, you need to engage, you need to serve, you need to be a part of my church. You need to be a part of ministry. And there's all opportunities here in our community, here in our church community, and around this globe where you can plug in, be a part of what's going on in his kingdom. And we'll help you do that. We'll help you plug in. So prayerfully take this time and and write those things in the card. If you're visiting with us, we say come join us for this great celebration of Jesus Christ every single week.